We have an unconfirmed report that a Boeing 747 airliner, which left Heathrow at 6 o'clock tonight, has crashed in the Lockerbie area of Dumfriesshire. But I must stress that this is an unconfirmed report. My name is Lorraine Kelly. 35 years ago, I was one of the first reporters to arrive here on the scene of the worst terrorist atrocity in European history. The bombing of Pan Am 103 above the small Scottish town of Lockerbie. For years, the focus has been on hunting down those who planted the bomb and bringing them to justice. But this is not that story. This is about the people of Lockerbie and what happened after the cameras left. I always remember what you seen that night. You know, it, it's just something horrific. It's difficult to tell people, you know. It was soon clear rescue workers would find no survivors among the passengers of the doomed aircraft. All 259 perished. Every square foot had bodies just lying side by side each other. And even the most experienced guys were struggling with this. That night changed thousands of lives on both sides of the Atlantic. All I saw were flames, and that's what I thought of Lockerbie. I never wished to come here, ever. Never wished to come here. The most painful moment of my mother and father's life was shown all over the world. The agony is not over yet, and it's going to take a long time for them to recover from the things that they've seen. You have to remember the trauma that the people that lived here went through, because it didn't just go away. Three and a half decades on, I want to know how those caught up in the disaster have begun to find peace. You've been strong enough to hang in all these years. This is the payoff to have this connection. And I need to confront my own difficult memories of that time. All these years I've told myself, you don't have PTSD. That's my brain dealing with something so horrendous that I've been pushing it away for 35 years. So I'm finally returning to Lockerbie. For the last 35 years, I've worked as a presenter on breakfast television. Three, two, one. Now, Lorraine is here at nine, morning. Thank you, thank you so much. I started working in TV in my early 20s. And by December 1988, I was Scotland correspondent for TVAM. Uh, Glasgow-based reporter Lorraine Kelly was one of the first to reach the crash site. This is her report. What was once a quiet border town is now a scene of utter devastation. This morning, police continue their search to try to ascertain what caused this horrific disaster. Lorraine Kelly, TVAM News, Lockerbie. It was the reports I did from Lockerbie that first got me promoted to the studio. Our editor looked up, he just said, ah, oh, should get her down here. There's something there. There's now no doubt that the Pan Am Jumbo, which crashed on the Scottish town of Lockerbie a week ago, killing 270 people, was blown out of the sky. It's actually quite difficult sometimes to equate the fact that I got my big break from something so awful. There's a bit of guilt there, I think, definitely. Whenever I drive over the Scottish border on my way home to Glasgow, I pass Lockerbie. But since the disaster, I've never felt able to revisit the town itself. Though I've always had a sense I've got unfinished business there. So now, I'm going back. I really want to talk to people, find out the actual human story and how it affected people of Lockerbie. Because you do wonder what the long-term effect is on them. I don't honestly know what to expect. At 7.03 p.m. on the 21st of December 1988, Pan Am 103 exploded in mid-air over Lockerbie. 
I remember that night getting a phone call and we were told that a light aircraft had come down. We could scramble like in 10 minutes, you know, as long as it took us to put our coats on and get out the door, there we were. So that's why we got there so early um, and, and before, before everyone else. As we approached the town that night, we had to dodge the debris that had fallen for miles around. You know, the sky was raining hell. There was chunks of still hot metal lying on the road. I remember we had a puncture. We had to stop and change it. On the outskirts of Lockerbie, we got our first real sight of the disaster, the nose cone of a jumbo jet. I was very young, you know, relatively inexperienced, really. And this was on a scale that even the most hardened foreign correspondent would have found difficult to process, I think. Police Sergeant Drew Young and his team were asked to guard the nose cone, which had fallen in a field next to Tundergarth Church. Hi, Drew. Lovely to meet you. Nice to meet you. And you. My memories of what I saw here are quite confused, and I want Drew to fill in some gaps. You know, it wasn't cordoned off mm -hmm. or anything at that point, so we must have got there incredibly early. Where exactly was it in the field? Just about another 50 or 60 yards up. It's funny, I always remember it, that we walked for miles through fields to get here, but the road's just there, so, so we didn't. So is it about here? Yeah, so I'd say about here. What do you remember about the actual night? I was a duty officer, I was on call. I heard the jets and I thought, oh, RAF's flying low tonight. Mm. And the, the jets were screaming. What did you see when you were... What you see in the films, the big balloon of fire. Yeah. Lit up the whole place. God. And blew me across the road. <laughs> and what, what did you think it was though? Because this is At just... At that point, I still thought it was a fighter. It wasn't until I come up here and saw the cockpit. I thought, oh, wait a minute. I think that's when it all dawned that's on us. That's when the penny it. dropped. Same with us. Mm -hmm. Same with Because we weren't sure either. Yeah, that's it. I do obviously remember getting so close to it that I could still feel it was warm. There wasn't anybody else around, certainly not anybody living, but I don't remember any bodies at all. No. I, do, I, I just don't. There were 17, 17 in the, the cockpit section. There were two or three bodies round the bottom of the cockpit. There was a man and top of his head was missing. Another man folded in half. Just lying there, his head between his ankles. Oh my God. Badness, that's all it was. Drew, I, I'm so, I, I can't imagine what it's like having those images in your head. I'm just glad that somehow I have shut all of that mm -hmm. out. I feel that an awful lot of people don't appreciate the scale of what happened mm -hmm. and the effect it had on the people here. I mean, how do people feel about what happened? People that lived through it, like you, people that experienced the absolute horror of it. A lot of folk wouldn't talk about it. They dealt with it. It's like a shutter coming down, you know. I said, I've got to go on with it. And do you think that that still exists in some way today, that people just don't want to talk about it at all? It's still there. Yeah, the town shut down that night. The town shut down. Oh, it's almost too much to take mm -hmm. in, isn't it? It really is. All those people. A lot of people. 270, so. You know, when Drew was describing there the condition of some of the bodies, it's strange because the bodies were so close to the cockpit, I must have seen terrible things, but I've just blanked it out. I really have. And in a way, I think maybe that's for the best because I came and I did my job and then I was able to leave and get on with my life. But I was able to do that. People here had to stay and deal with the aftermath. Um, and deal with all of these things that were happening and be in the centre of attention, and then the world moves on. But you're left. You're left. You have to somehow come to terms with it, somehow get over it, and somehow deal with it. And how do you?
In the hours after the disaster, Lockerbie's town hall was converted into a temporary morgue to house the bodies which had fallen from Pan Am 103. 18-year-old Colin Dorrance was the youngest policeman on duty that night. Hey. Hi, Colin. Hi, Lorraine. Colin was there when a local farmer brought in the youngest victim of the disaster, 20-month-old Bryony Owen. I was asked to stand guard at one of the side doors and it was at that point that Bryony was brought to us. And we hadn't really picked up straight away that, that uh, this was one of the passengers from the plane. She looked like she was asleep, a little bit of mud on the face maybe, and uh, vivid blonde hair, mm. that's what I remember, and wrapped in a, I think it was a duffel coat. And we then walked into the main hall and the place just fell quiet. Bryony and her 29-year-old mother Yvonne were travelling to meet family in Boston for Christmas. Was she the first to be She was the very first and it, it made it so stark. The room was empty and we had such a small child with us. Mm. I kind of didn't know what to do really, but mm. laid her down and um, it was one of those moments that just, I will never forget. God, that's horrendous. Over the course of the next few days, more than 200 bodies were retrieved from the surrounding area and brought to the town hall to join Bryony's. It was a shocking, difficult, almost like a, a scene from a horror movie. So it's absolutely, this was just covered in yeah, dead ev bodies everywhere ev you Every could square see. foot had bodies just lying side beside each other. And in time, they were all then given a coffin each to be laid in. And even the most experienced guys who had seen it all by then were struggling with this. Innocent children being involved was just very, very hard to take. God, how do you cope with that? Did you get any sort of help at all? There was nothing formal put in place. You would maybe, at break time, you know, let off some steam and, and talk a little bit, but mm. uh, you just learn to live with it and mm. sort of, I, mm. I call it like putting it in a box, but you just can't help but remember at some point that box is there. Was there any time when you felt like just breaking down? There are times I have been emotional, feeling a little bit, you know, uh, lost with it all, you know, and as if you were on your own with it too. You get the political yeah. commentators talking about this subject yeah. as if it was a political football. And you get angry, you, you, you think, who are they to talk about this? Do you wish counselling was something that had been on offer? Knowing what I know now, yes, I'd have taken that, I think. Mm, I think I would too. Um, and I wondered whether in the years that followed, um, whether I wouldn't have benefited from just sitting down and, and having that time. Psychological support, even for those like Colin, who'd been involved in major disasters, was not common back in the 1980s. It was very much the whole stiff upper lip cliche. That's exactly what we were like, you know, we, that, that, in that era, that's what everybody was like. You know, if I'd broken down, that would have been so unacceptable, almost like a show of weakness. Back then, you didn't show emotion like that. You just buried it, buried it. One of the most traumatic aspects of the Lockerbie disaster was that it brought absolute horror into the lives and homes of ordinary people. This is where Park Place meets Rosebank Crescent. A huge piece of the fuselage of Pan Am 103 crashed here, narrowly avoiding most of the houses, but scattering the bodies of more than 60 passengers onto the roofs and back gardens of local residents. I don't remember all the upsetting things I saw during the disaster, but my memories of this shocking scene are all too clear. At the moment of impact, Peter Gisica, a 36-year-old mechanic, was at home watching TV. He lives in the same house today. In his back garden, Peter was confronted by something that, three and a half decades on, he still finds difficult to talk about. 
that time we had a hedge up there, mm -hmm. right up there. And uh, this young girl was over the fence, over the hedge, and uh, she'd, she'd one shoe on. This here is actually the hedge, right up here. Right. The young woman whose body had fallen into Peter's garden was 21-year-old American Lindsay Otenasek, one of 35 Syracuse University students who died on their way home after three months studying in London. That's where I put a wreath. Right. Every, every year I put a wreath in there. Just to remember, yeah. Oh. But, uh, very, very hard, you know. No, it is. Yes. I know. Uh, very hard. I know. To it's... see something like that in your, your, oh. your house, in your home. And that's how... It should take a minute. That's... This makes me sad, like, you know, to see the young people, 21 year old. It's difficult to tell people, you know. It, it's what you've seen that night. It always, you always remember what you've seen that night. You know, it, it's just something horrific, you know. It is 35 years on. It clearly, obviously, uh -huh. still affects you greatly. Do you tend to talk about it with other people in Lockerbie? A lot of people say, oh, leave it alone, leave it alone, like, you know, and a lot of them just go into their daily life, you know, and it was... Just want to put it behind them? Sort of put it behind them, yeah. you know. I... When did you find out more about the girl that was here, the body that you found? It was two months later, I got in. I knock at the door, mm -hmm. and this uh, lady and gentleman came to the door. And, uh, he says, I believe you found my daughter in your garden. Lindsay Otenasek's mother and father, Peggy and Richard, had travelled to Peter's house from their home in Baltimore to see where their daughter's body had been found. Of course, she broke down tears. Of course she did. Uh, for a shiny pebble on the ground here, so I picked it up, cleaned it. Oh, that was a pebble from where, where you'd found it. Yeah. And uh, did you give that to her mum? Yes, and that's how we became friendly. Since their visit to Lockerbie, Peter has formed a close bond with the Otenisek family and recently travelled to Baltimore with his wife Susan to see them. He regularly speaks to Rick, Lindsay's older brother. Rick, hi, it's Lorraine here. Hi, Hello. Rick. You all right? Great to see you all. And you, yeah. and you. I've been with Peter and he's been telling me all about the connection, you know, with, you, with your sister and your and your mum, of course, and how much you all you all mean to each other. How important was it to you to your mum and dad to come here and, and to meet Peter? Oh, incredibly important. The connection now with Peter and Susan, we, we have family in Lockerbie. When they came mm -hmm. last year, last summer, mm -hmm. we had this beautiful mass. Um, and I remember speaking on behalf of the family saying, <sighs> to Peter, whatever you've carried with you all these years, leave at this altar. No. So, you left some things at that altar, Peter. My family and I did. And and like I said, this is the payoff yeah. to have this connection. Yeah. Right? So. No. And how important yeah. that is and how much... You, but you've helped, Peter. Yeah. You've really helped. Oh. You have. I've got to do it. No, I know, Peter, but you've been strong enough to hang in all these years. I'm very much in touch with my own pain of my loss, but to hear yeah, your story yeah. and to realize that's what they had to wake up to every day. They, they were living in the in the carnage um, and what it must have been like for you all. They're very stoic mm -hmm. in Lockerbie. Yeah. And, yes. and I think maybe people didn't quite appreciate the trauma oh, and all the agony yeah. that they went through. I mean, this is before I think we really identified what 
unresolved trauma in your life can do to you. If you're not careful, it does consume you. I think what struck me most about talking to Peter was how it still affects him so much. I mean, he's such a good soul and he's so kind. And obviously, 35 years on, it still is very close to him. And I think Peter's carrying a huge burden with him. Like all of the people I've spoken to here, Peter didn't get any help for the horrific things he saw. And I want to know what kind of support was available in the town. Marjorie McQueen is a well-known figure in Lockerbie and a former Lord Mayor here. Oh, it's lovely to meet you, Marjorie. Thank you for asking us here. In December 1988, Marjorie's late husband, Kenneth, was the senior GP in the town and dealt with the psychological impact on the community. What was his experience of how people were dealing with this mentally? You know, how it was affecting them? Quite a lot of people, he felt, who should have been asking for help, didn't. I know that there are people who were psychologically very, very much distressed by it. Quite a lot of people found that alcohol was helping a bit, and there seemed to be quite a lot of that about. Yeah. An awful lot of the children started bedwetting. But there were psychiatrists and psychologists assigned to the town. There is a sense, though, of people, you know, sort of maybe saying to the world, leave us alone, <laughs> let us get on with things, yeah. you know, just yeah. let us do this in, a, in yes. our own time. Yes, yes. I, I think Lockerbie as a community was quite tight at that time. I think they felt that it, it just wasn't the done thing, you know. You don't ask for help for a mental condition. And I think that caused an awful lot of people to suffer for a lot longer, maybe, than they might have. Yes, I think yeah. that's possibly very true. There are people today who still think about it, and, mm -hmm. and I, I do. If I hear a noise, uh, usually aircraft noise, that I'm not sure about, I will go out in the back garden and have a look. 35 years on, I still do it. Mm. I still do it. Because the unthinkable happened? Yeah. It will take people here a long time to fully recover from this tragedy. Now they need to be left in peace to slowly begin to rebuild their shattered lives. But Lockerbie wasn't left in peace. The press intrusion went on for years and was not welcomed by residents who were struggling to get back to normal. With the anniversary of the disaster falling on the 21st of December, the town didn't put up its Christmas lights for over a decade. And to this day, there is still no annual commemoration of the tragedy here. When Pan Am 103 exploded over Lockerbie, its wing section and fuel tanks crashed into the ground here in Sherwood Crescent, where there's now a memorial park. Over 100 tonnes of aviation fuel ignited on impact, destroying more than 20 homes. Wreckage ploughed through whole blocks of houses. At least seven were completely flattened, many others severely damaged. 11 Lockerbie residents died instantly, including three children. They were probably sitting watching the telly, having a cup of tea. The kids were probably getting doing their homework, maybe, getting ready to go to bed and then death came out the sky. We were able to get really close to this crater. And it's so strange because I don't remember there being any members of the emergency service here. I don't remember there being any fire brigade or police or army, but there must have been. And I'm wondering whether the reality is mixed up with the nightmares that I have. Am I remembering my nightmares or am I remembering what actually happened? What I do remember vividly, that smell, that aviation fuel smell, that even to this day, when I smell that, it takes me back right here. I know that many people in the town want to stop dwelling on the past. But for others, talking about the disaster has been crucial 
in helping them come to terms with what happened that night. Hello. Hi. <laughs> come on in. Thank you. Nice to meet nice you. To meet you. Okay. Gillian Moffat was nine years old in December 1988. She and her family moved from Sherwood Crescent. Only weeks before, Pan Am 103 gouged a huge crater in the street, killing several of her neighbours. Her old family house was badly damaged. So what do you remember at nine years old? It was just the most surreal experience. And I remember Mum taking us through to have a look. We just went to the barrier and I remember the roof was just about off. The way the house was, we had our bedroom up the stairs and we would have been in there. That we would have yeah. been in that house. And I remember just being absolutely devastated. While no one in Gillian's family died that night, her husband Andrew's aunt and uncle lived in Sherwood Crescent and neither of them survived. How's your husband with it all? Does he talk about it? Uh, no. Does he not? Is he just drawn a line? Yes. That's it? Yeah, he doesn't talk about it, he doesn't. But he doesn't talk about how he feels? Oh, no, oh, no, no, no. And then uh, there will be lots of people who don't ever want to talk about it again, and that's absolutely fine. But you have to remember the trauma that the people that lived here went through for years and years, because it didn't just go away. How did all the trauma that yeah, you'd kept yeah. inside, uh -huh. how did that sort of manifest itself? I think it's always been something that has triggered it. Like, I remember going back to school, the helicopter went over. I just cried, I, I just couldn't, I got taken out of the class. A few years later, same thing happened. It was fighter jets went over on some sort of night exercise and I was on the floor. Oh, I was geez. completely in the fetal position and Oh, God, I could have been back there. Gillian, do you ever have, like, or d did you have nightmares? Oh, yeah. Because I've certainly had nightmares yeah. about it. Mm -hmm. Can you remember any of them? Everything's got planes in it. If there's something going to happen in my mind, mm. <laughs> it's got an aeroplane in it. Mm. Yeah. After struggling for many years with the long-term effects of the Lockerbie disaster, in 2018, Gillian had a breakdown and had to take time off her job as a midwife. Were you diagnosed with something? What did they say? Yeah, they said it, it was PTSD. Right. Yeah, I couldn't work. Um, and I really was in a, a really dark place. When you get a diagnosis of PTSD, mm -hmm. how did that make you feel? Did you feel a sense of relief that at least somebody had yeah. told you this? I suppose, in a way, yes. But there's almost a bit of, well, there's probably lots of people have it. <laughs> Yeah. So why am I special? Because I'm not. I'm not. Do you think it's self-indulgent? Do you feel that? I think it's a conditioned response to the culture of not talking about it for so long. Mm. Let's face it, at any time when you have a loss or a trauma, the one thing you need to do is talk about it. And that is a healing process, isn't it? That's yeah. how we get through things. I'm so glad you got the, the help yeah. that you needed. Yeah. I just wish she'd got it yeah. so long ago. Uh, exactly. What Gillian said really resonated with me, that everybody is allowed to have some sort of trauma from this. It's OK. It's not a sign of weakness to say, actually, I was really badly affected by that and I still am today. It sort of gets me thinking about, I have never really thought about what it's done to me and the long-term effects to me as well. But I was only there reporting on it. I wasn't living it. I was able to go in and then go back to my life. So I don't feel as if I have the right to feel traumatised. Yeah, that's it. That's, right. that's it. That because good. I'm awful, awful concerned about that. I don't want any people to think that I'm... No, I know. That I've, you know that I'm special. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's exactly the same as Gillian. It was exactly <laughs> same as she was saying that. It was like, oh my God, that's exactly how I feel. Oh, jeez. Gillian was diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder, and I'm now wondering how many others in the town were affected by this condition. Well, this is an article about the mental health consequences of the Lockerbie disaster. This was done after talking to people involved. Um, ah, fascinating. Wait, let's see what they come up with. 
So they're talking about people in Lockerbie and they're saying, in all, 73% had or had had PTSD. That's huge, 73% of the people they talk to. On each scale, those exposed to dismembered bodies had the highest scores. And that's really just about everyone I've spoken to, you know, Peter and Drew and Colin, and me too. You know, initially I don't remember seeing anything like that, and I must have. I've left Scotland and come to Wiltshire to meet one of the psychiatrists who worked in Lockerbie with members of the emergency services and local residents. Professor Gordon Turnbull is now an expert on PTSD and what he learned in the wake of the disaster has helped to transform our understanding of the condition. Here we are, hello. Hello. <laughs> Very nice, nice to see you. Nice to see you. Gordon is currently recovering from COVID, which has affected his voice, but has kindly agreed to talk to me. PTSD is a term that's banded around quite yes. a lot, and a lot of people don't really understand what exactly it is. PTSD is a normal reaction to shocking, life-threatening events. Before Lockerbie, there was a widespread misunderstanding about PTSD, that it was something that some people shouldn't develop and that they weren't entitled to. And then Lockerbie happened. A lot of people actually then began to realise it's the mind's way of coming to terms with things which are too terrible for it to comprehend. Flashbacks and nightmares give you another opportunity mm. to process your traumatic memories. So PTSD is actually like a defence mechanism in a way? Well, I couldn't put it better. It's actually abnormal not to have it. And Lockerbie has given us an opportunity to be able to see it for what it is, treat it when we need to, and not ignore it. But an awful lot of people living in Lockerbie didn't really get as much help as they should. I know you talked to some of them, didn't you? Talked to about 100. What sort of symptoms were they showing initially? The classic ones, flashbacks, nightmares, avoidance. The thing that I found was I was, I was getting flashbacks and nightmares where I was almost above that horrible scene. And going back, I found I've been thinking about it a lot more. There have been a lot more dreams or, or nightmares, I should say. Flashbacks and, and nightmares, they are the cornerstones of PTSD. They don't happen in any other condition. I honestly didn't know that. So you think I had PTSD or have had it or still have it? If you've got flashbacks, you've got PTSD. But I don't feel as though I'm allowed to have something like PTSD because I was just a reporter there. By saying that you're not entitled, you're trying to separate yourself from an event. You're avoiding belonging to it. It's a defence mechanism. But you have to stop avoiding Lockerbie in order to be able to heal. All these years I've told myself, you don't have PTSD, you're not entitled to have that, you shouldn't, you're not allowed to have that. Actually, that's the norm. That's my brain dealing with something so horrendous that I've been pushing it away for 35 years. Although revisiting Lockerbie has unlocked a lot of difficult memories for me, I still feel I need to go back to discover how, in more recent years, the town itself has started to heal. I hadn't been back to Lockerbie for 35 years and now I'm returning there in a matter of weeks and I feel almost a compulsion to go back. I just want to find out how that community managed to sort of get back to normal after something so horrendous. We are now approaching Lockerbie when leaving us here. Colin Dorrance, the retired policeman I talked to on my first visit, locked away his memories of the disaster for years and I want to know how and why that changed. I know you didn't want to talk about the disaster for a long time, like many of us, I mean, myself included, but what made you want to engage with that again? You just put it away and you get on with life. And um, that was the case for 24 years, but it took my daughter to announce that she wanted to go to Syracuse University, that 
drew me out of my shell. She goes off to the US and she starts to meet many of the families of the students who were killed. And gradually, one by one, the families started to get in touch. They would reach out and some would then want to come and visit. Over the last 10 years, Colin has welcomed over 250 people affected by the disaster to Lockerbie, many of them still struggling with their loss. It goes on to this day, there's, there's still people coming and they're reliving that time in their life again. So they're deciding, I either leave this in the psychological loft or I deal with it and engage with it. Doing what you do and helping, does it help you? Very much. I didn't realise how much under the surface I simmered away with this subject. I think in the last 10 years, being able to talk and just slowly release some of that anger has just helped. Five years ago, encouraged by these new connections, Colin and several others who'd lived through the disaster set out on a charity cycle ride from Lockerbie via New York to Syracuse University. During their 600-mile journey, many of the families who'd lost loved ones on Pan Am 103 came to cheer them on, including Peggy O'Tenisek, mother of Syracuse student Lindsay, and her brother Rick. What you all are doing, just an incredible gesture. Another Syracuse student who died that night was 21-year-old Nicole Boulanger. Nicole's sister Renee and best friend Kim have travelled to Lockerbie from the US and Colin has been showing them around. I've arranged to meet them at the town hall where all of those who died are remembered. Hello, Hi. lovely to see you. It's a really pleasure good to meet, to meet you. you. Really good oh, to, so meet nice you. to meet you. And in a very special room as well, isn't yes. it? Because yeah. we've got this beautiful window. It really brings it home, doesn't it? All the different nationalities. Yes. Yeah. I wanted really, first of all, to talk to you about your sister and, and what she was like. Uh, that's my sister and I, December of 1969, Christmas. You're adorable, that's gorgeous. See, we were only 53 weeks apart. I was going to say, you're like twins. Yeah. You really are. And we celebrated our birthday, you know, every year at, on the same so day, because we were only a, a week apart in October. And that's our black and white. My sister was very, very shy growing up. And then she auditioned for something her freshman year of high school, and she got the lead. And when we went and saw her perform, we were like, wait a minute, that's Nicole, <laughs> you know? And we couldn't believe it. Every time at Syracuse she yeah. was going to perform, I literally could not wait to see what she was going to do. She was yeah. incredible. Nicole boarded Pan Am 103 at Heathrow on the evening of the 21st of December, 1988. Her parents, Janine and Ron Boulanger, had arranged to pick her up from JFK in New York. Renee was in their hometown near Boston when she learned of the disaster. My mother called my, <clears throat> my boyfriend and said, get her home. Reporters were in front of my house asking if I was waiting for Nicole Boulanger. I turned on the television, and that's when I saw my mother on the floor of the airport screaming, not my baby, and my dad was trying to pick her up. Janine Boulanger's reaction to the news of her daughter's death became one of the most harrowing moments of the Lockerbie disaster. That image and your mum, when that happened, I'll never forget that. I don't think anybody who saw yeah. that will ever forget mm -hmm. it. It was like utter, raw grief. The most painful moment of my mother and father's life was, you know, captured and shown all over the world. Yeah, it was, and it brought it home to everyone. Yeah. I think. Yeah. I ran from the pain for quite a while, and I numbed myself from the pain, you know, through alcohol because um, the pain just was so incredibly hard. 
I've been through a rough journey through this. I know. You know, and I know I'm not the only one, you know? Mm. And I have not spoken to media ever before. I've never done it, ever. But I feel I have to now. I feel like it's time um, to let people know. Why is it so important, though, for you to talk now, 35 years on? Back in the 80s, you didn't talk about that stuff. Nobody did. And if you did, you know, you were kind of shunned. Yes. And a lot of us suffer from post-traumatic stress. You know, I wasn't really diagnosed until almost my 40s. Like Renee, Kim Wickham was diagnosed with PTSD in the years after the Lockerbie disaster. She was due to fly home with Nicole on Pan Am 103, but at the last minute, changed her plans. I visited Nicole that morning, and um, I'll never forget it. I, I gave her a Christmas um, present so she could listen on the plane a cassette tape with musical theater songs. And I was in Germany when I found out my grandmother called on the phone. And I said, yeah, what, what's going on? Why are you calling so late? And um, she said, your plane crashed. And I, you know, right away, I was like, what are you, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? And um, I knew Nicole was on the plane. You know, uh, we turned the TV on and all I saw were flames. And that's what I thought of Lockerbie, just flames and terror and horror. And I never wished to come here, ever. Never wished to come here. Five years ago, Kim and Renee decided to travel to Lockerbie for the first time. Why did you think, oh, I need to go back there? I was struggling a lot. I kind of wished I was dead because I thought I deserved to be. Why, why was it Nicole out of anybody? Why wasn't it me? I felt so guilty, you know? And it's not surprising that you feel that sort of, it's called survivor's guilt, isn't it? Yes. It was overwhelming for a very long time. I think I was just desperate to, you know, finally heal. And I thought, well, maybe it is time that I go. So, you know, you don't really understand the connection until you actually physically come here. Did you feel the, the same? I did. When I came here, I felt comfortable talking about it because they knew exactly what I was going to. You know, it was like this big weight was, was lifted. Do you feel she's in a, a sort of peaceful place? Absolutely. Oh, yeah. yeah. 100%. Kim, Renee and Colin have invited me to come with them to Lockerbie's Garden of Remembrance. All 270 victims of the disaster are honoured here. But Nicole Boulanger, and the 16 others whose bodies were never recovered have a special headstone. For her sister and her best friend, this is very much Nicole's final resting place. It still feels like yesterday. I know, are you okay? I'm sorry, yeah. it's just awful. It really is, it really is. You know, the people of Lockerbie have been so kind and caring. If it had to happen, I'm glad it happened here. Thirty-five years ago, something so horrendous happened here. It was the worst terrorist atrocity in European history. And I was here and I saw things that I really shouldn't have seen, especially at such a young age. But one thing that's really struck me coming back and it was very important for me to come back was how this community has healed itself. And that's such a testament to their strength. Also how the people here have helped the bereaved, particularly those that have come over from America. And I think that goes two ways, because it's helped the people of Lockerbie as well. Lockerbie to me was always that image in my head of the crater, the nose cone, the flames, the smells, the horrific sights. 
And I've always sort of pushed away all of those thoughts and images because that's how your mind and body cope with a trauma like that. 35 years on to come back to this beautiful, beautiful border town where everybody's made me so welcome and shared their stories and trusted me with their stories. That has helped me so much and given me a lot of comfort as well. I see Lockerbie now in a completely different light.